box. So this is the beginning of my tutorial series. I'm going to start doing various tutorials on how to make different things. Today we're going to be working on a bone pendant with an abalone inlay. I decided to do this particular pendant because I, well, <laughs> I've got a long list of things to make people, but I have a client that sent me an alligator scoot, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, a long time ago, and I've tried everything I could possibly think of to make that into a piece of jewelry. But in the end, I've just determined that it's not really a carvable material, at least not without doing significant damage or trying to modify it chemically in some way, which is not really what I do. So this first item is going to be for her. All of the items that I make for all of these tutorials will end up being giveaways or gifts for friends or family. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started on this bone carving tutorial today. Um, if you'll stick through to the end of the video, you'll get to see some photos of my um, carved work. Uh, Alright, so I'm not going to lie, it is hot as balls out here. Anyway, well, let's get started. I have sketched out a pendant. Um, this one is going to be all bone here with a kind of a filigree swirl design. And then I'm going to inlay the edge here with abalone. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take down all of this, this extra material uh, with my sanding belt disc so that I can get like the main shape. Um, I also might take a little bit of curvature off the back uh, so that it's a little bit easier to carve out these filigree curves. So I'm not super sure how many of you have ever used one of these uh, sanding discs, but I tell you what, when it comes to bone carving or any, any type of work like this, it really is a lifesaver. It beats doing it by hand with a jeweler's saw. I have shaved down to the sketch and then I kind of flattened out the back a little bit. Since this area is going to be the back, I don't really ever worry about that super much, but it's likely um, a lot of that will be carved down anyway, due to the fact that I round out my pieces for the most part on both sides. So let the carving begin. So as you can see, everything is different. It's because my phone died. I'm trying for the life of me to remember what we've done so far. Um, but I do know that what I did was fail to show you guys where the bone, like what the bone looks like before you cut it. Um, so I have a piece here. Um, it's a short piece, but it's basically part of a cattle. It's a, it's a cattle bone, um, a leg bone. I usually just kind of carve out like um, what I want to carve on one side of it and then I'll just take the bandsaw and I'll just I'll cut it in half this way um, and then cut my piece out to try to save as much bone as possible for uh, another carving so yeah okay guys so we're in position right here to get started on our on our pendant um, make sure if you're gonna do any bone carving that you have some sort of dust mask because this does get really dusty um, in addition, you're going to want to have a pair of safety glasses uh, just in case any bone fragments tend to fly up. You really need to be using safety glasses anytime you're using a rotary tool anyway. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get started um, and we'll see what we got. So throughout this carving process, you'll notice that I do tend to uh, change bits a lot. There's not really any particular reason why I do this, um, other than the fact that I, uh, I don't like to do the same thing in one spot for a long period of time. Uh, it's nice to be able to change up the bits, change up the pressure on my fingers, and, and uh, really keep myself from getting bored with the process. It is good to note right here that it is easier to do a filigree swirl uh, if you drill a hole in the center first. Um, you don't have to do it this way, but I've, I've decided that it's a lot easier to go outward with the curb from the drilled hole uh, rather than trying to carve a trench all the way around. Um, in addition, I do use a combination of diamond-tipped bits and carbide bits. 
Uh, there's not really any good way to explain what bits do what. It's best for you to just get a piece of bone and some of these bits and just try uh, different things with them and experiment on your own. You'll find out what works best and what doesn't. The total amount of carving time for this project ended up being around 8 hours. So in order to compress 8 hours of video footage into one under 20 minute video, I have had to speed up all of this footage by 600%. I've also cut out bit changes and several things that really aren't important um, to the video. So I left this particular bit change in the footage because I wanted to point out the fact uh, that there are different collet sizes for different sized bits. Uh, for those of you that are new to rotary tools or carving machines, um, you do have to keep that in mind when you buy your bits. Make sure you have the right size collets and uh, make sure you have a rooster crowing in the background of all your voiceovers. So what I'm doing here is I went ahead and used a barrel carbide bit to cut out a trench for our abalone inlay and I'm using a flat metal file to level out that area. You want to make sure that the area that you're going to place your abalone in is as flat and smooth as possible. So I went ahead and cut out a lot of the footage of me shaping the abalone for the inlay. Honestly, it takes a really long time, so you, you know it would get really boring if I included it all. Once you get it shaped and placed correctly, you want to go ahead and glue it in with a CA glue of some brand or kind. There's lots of different companies that make CA glue, but I've had the best of luck with it. Uh, don't skimp on the glue. As you can see, I just got bit by a mosquito. I hate those things. We got the inlay cut and glued, which is a pain, as you guys can see. Um, mostly, too, because I'm a perfectionist and I just like it to fit together perfectly and be perfectly level. If you guys take the extra time to take care of every little minor detail in your carving, um, the finished product will be a lot more polished and, uh, you know, it'll just be a lot better quality. Uh, so don't be afraid to take some extra time just to make sure that all of your elements line up properly. Um, so we're gonna let this sit overnight and then tomorrow we're gonna come back out and we're gonna finish up the carving. Howdy folks. Okay, so it's been longer than 24 hours, but uh, I actually got rained out yesterday and it's a little cloudy now, but I'm thinking I might be able to fit the rest of this in uh, before it starts to rain. We're supposed to get the outer bands of a hurricane next week, so yay. So hurry up and get this done. So basically what we have here is we have a carving that's been sitting in the vise for over 24 hours, um, a couple of days. Now it looks really yucky right now, uh, but that's okay. My glasses are fogging up so I can't see anything. Um, but that's okay because we're going to clean up the rest of it now and polish up the abalone. So let's get started. So just as we did originally, we're going to take the pendant over to the sanding disc and cut off the extra abalone so that the pendant is back into its uh, final shape. So now I'm going to switch over to a cone-shaped carbide bit, and I just want to point out that this bit can be mean. I've cut myself with it quite a few times, so do be careful. But this bit is really good for removing a lot of material. So to remove even more material, I often switch over to these barrel-shaped sanding bits. They come with various different grits and can be really handy. Also, I want to point out that I might not be pronouncing everything that I've mentioned today correctly. Uh, go easy on me. I don't claim to be a professional. The carving machine that I'm using is the Fordham TX model with flex shaft. I have two different hand pieces, though I'm not exactly sure what the name of them are. I am going to include a link at the bottom of the description of the video that will lead you to the Fordham website and the kit that you can purchase uh, that I purchased. In addition, for speed control, I do like to use the Fordham foot pedal. Uh, a lot of people don't like the foot pedal because they say that they have issues trying to maintain a constant speed. You know, I've never really had that issue. Uh, the foot pedals are so heavy and well made, I never find my foot being tired or anything of that nature. Um, 
using a control knob would be too inconvenient for me. I would have to stop every couple seconds or minutes uh, to change that knob and change that speed to keep from uh, flaking the edges off of a of, off of a piece. As you can see in this portion of the video, I'm using the cone bit again. This is a perfect example to show how you can get into those difficult angles and work on small details. This micro barrel shaped carbide bit is good for working uh, even smaller details. I use it quite often uh, in places that I can't get to with the other bits. It's good for edging, it's good for writing words, it's good for, uh, you know, just small detail in general. So in conversations with a lot of people, they have expressed interest in bone carving to me, but they are concerned that they can't do it because they can't afford all of these Fordham tools. Uh, you know guys, to be totally honest, you can use a Dremel 4000 with a flex shaft. You just gotta keep in mind that the Dremels tend to burn through their brushes a lot faster and the flex shafts for, by Dremel go out really quickly. Um, if you're gonna use this as a hobby, the Dremel should work just fine for you, but if you're gonna do it more as a job or kind of a side business, I would highly recommend saving up your money and getting a more powerful tool like the Fordham. So just for reference, if any of you have any questions about any of the tools I'm using or if there's something that I failed to cover in the tutorial that you're curious about, you are welcome to leave a comment in the comments section below or you can message me on any of my various uh, websites or social media. I'd love to answer your questions and I'll do my best to get back with you as soon as possible. So I want to talk a little bit about carving on the abalone. You can remove material from the top of the abalone. Uh, however, I recommend that you try to remove as minimal amount of material as possible. Although abalone is layered, uh, so layered meaning when you carve off the top of, uh, uh, of the abalone, you're going to reveal other colors underneath. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of the bright, brilliant colors are going to be thickly layered all throughout. So if the top of your abalone is bright and, and beautiful, uh, just keep your carving to a minimal because you might risk losing some of that shine. If you want your filigree swirls to have a little extra pop of detail, I really like these round carbide bits for that reason. Uh, they carve out a really nice looking smooth trench in swirls. This is really handy for making, like I said, filigree. Also, anything resembling waves. So I know it's not on screen right now, but throughout this video you'll notice that I have tape on my vise. When you're working with any items like this that are potentially breakable, you want to put some tape on your vise so that there's a little bit of padding in between the metal and the object. It'll keep you from ruining a lot of projects. You'll notice here I'm using a round carbide bit to punch some detail into the top of this pendant. You know, sometimes the most simple detail can make the boldest statement. I can't stress enough the importance of finish work. Uh, you know, if you take extra time making sure that all of your details are perfect, your piece is going to stand out a lot more, and you're going to be happier with your end result. Another thing to remember about bone carving is that it's similar to painting. Uh, if you have to go back over a detail a second time because you had to make an adjustment, it's really no big deal. Mm -hmm. 
don't forget to drill a hole for your cord. Admittedly, this is not my favorite part of this process. Now you have to sand. Sand, 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 sand. What I do is I get sandpaper from a local auto parts store. I like to start uh, really low at about either 220 or 450 and I sand all the way up to 2200 or 2500 depending on what I can find. I cut the sandpaper in little bitty strips and I wet sand all of it. Um, if you wet sand you're going to get a smoother shine. Uh, you've got to take a lot of time and care to do this. You need to hit every part of this pendant with every single grit. Uh, it's going to make a better finish and is the key to a beautiful shiny pendant. Lately I've been signing my work. It's not necessary, but I think it adds a nice custom touch. My trick to this last brilliant pop of shine is acrylic nail polishing compound. Uh, you can get it from any nail supply store, or if you know anyone that's a nail tech, they could probably get it for you. I'm sure any plastic polishing compound will work, but I used to be a nail tech, this is what I had, and it works great. Make sure to use a leather buffing wheel on this. Hopefully this will inspire you to make your own bone pendant. I'd love to see what you make. Um, if you make something, make a video of it, tag me in it. I'd love to see it. Uh, share and share alike. So I'm going to try to put out a tutorial maybe once a month. You know, don't hold me to that. I'm very busy. <laughs> I, uh, I spend a lot of time filling orders. So this is just kind of what I do on the side in my free time. Uh, I like to make various things. I am going to do some dreadlock tutorials, dreadlock bead tutorials and maybe even some dreadlock tutorials. I'm not super sure. Um, people ask me all the time how to do dreadlocks, so I, I might just make a video so that I can just give them a link to the video. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any other ideas or any other requests of what you would like to see me make, uh, feel free to hit me up on any of my social media. Uh, my website's heatherfish.com. Uh, you can check out my Etsy shop, Heatherfish Creations. Um, I'm everywhere, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, all that, but uh, yeah, just feel free to hit me up on one of those places and say, hey Heather, I want to see you make a, you know, purple polka dotted metal yard sculpture. Uh, yeah, so.